Greetings from Japan, non-Western art appreciation class. I hope you are all doing fantastically well. Today I'm in one of my favorite spots on the entire planet, one of the most amazing cultures me and my family have ever been able to visit. And right behind you represents the Mount Fuji, the holiest spot in all of Japan for Shinto and the Shinto belief founded here in Japan. Today we're gonna to study the ideas of why Japan is so important um, to world culture. And as we begin then, let's run through our top 10 list like we normally do. First off, Japan has a basic understanding that has to do with the idea of the importance of nature that is actually called Shinto. Shinto basically the way of the kami or the way of the spirit. They have a completely new way of looking at feminine beauty in the geisha. They are the most important culture largely for creating postmodern architecture that had to be built in um, magnificent ways in order to accommodate um, large populations in the aftermath of World War II, particularly with the, the destruction of two of their cities, Hiroshima um, and Nagasaki. They currently have the fifth largest economy on earth, um, so they are right up there with the United States and, and China. Um, they have woodblock prints, these prints which actually was used as paper that's going to impact the Impressionists and later on develop into anime. They are the place in the world where we test electronics um, in a remarkably kind of um, commercial capitalist way. And they are one of the leadings in modern day filmmaking, including the filmmaker that actually is shown here, which is Akira Kurosawa, who is as important to movies as almost anyone in human history. So all these different reasons are things we're going to study and have an idea as we look at um, Japan and its impact on world culture. Now, if you don't know, Japan is about the size of California and is off the Chinese coast. So off about a couple hundred miles, we have Korea up here as well. So right here, so it's off the coast of Japan. So they do share some cultural features, but Japan and China haven't got along for a number of years, actually a number of centuries. Most recently, Japan took over parts of Eastern China during World War II, and they treated the Chinese population, particularly women, comfort women, which were basically prostitutes, very, very, very bad. Now, Japanese landscapes are really kind of amazing for the population of Japan. Japan has about 110 million people to 120 million people, which puts it about 10th or 11th, right around the size of Mexico and the World Population Index. The most famous landscape from Japan is the one where I'm in front of as well here, see the opposite side, and that is actually going to be Mount Fuji. They're very much known for gorgeous forests that are controlled by Shinto kami spirits rice farming for the majority, fishing, and then of course these beautiful shrines, these Tori gates that actually come up. Now, Japanese culture, we can date back almost the better part of about 2000 years when we officially look at Japanese culture. And it starts with these two cultures, um, ceramic cultures, agricultural cultures, the Joman and the Yayoi. So you can see the Joman culture is from about 100 to 300 BCE. The Yayoi culture is about 300 BCE to 300 CE. And they have stylistic features that are similar. So the Joman culture starts off with these female figures going back centuries. And they have this ritual symbolism that shows up of tattooing all over the body. The middle period of Joman, they're known for this flame motif. And at the very end of the Jomon, they had this erased cord pattern where they would put cord designs, but they were erased then with kind of incised lines forming two different contrasting designs on their pottery. And so this is the most decorative pre-agricultural pottery that we have in the entire planet. No surprise that it starts in China with their reverence for nature and turning natural elements like earth into fired pottery that they can be used. And Japan has one of the greatest ceramic traditions in the world along with China. So if we look at the difference between the way bodies look, let's look at one of the first images of the female body within the Western world. And that is going to be the Venus of Wundorf, made of stone, 20,000 BCE, BCE over here, versus the Jaman pottery style of about 2000 BCE with the ritual symbolism that they're doing. You can see in each, we have, particularly in this case, it's Venus of Wundorf, an abstracted body, Whereas over here, we have a much more realistic body that shows up. This body, of course, has much more decoration. And because it is made of clay, it is a little bit easier 
to make the decorations and the idea of the stylized space. Whereas here, because it's small scale rock sculpture, very hard. Both emphasize the different aspects of the body going all the way down, even showing knees in the bent here. And here we actually see it over here. You can see the kneecaps and basically the pants and the, the scarification or at least the tattooing that's take place. So two very early depictions of the human form from two very different cultures sharing many of the same features. Now, when we look at Japanese pottery, we have in a series of different pottery that we can look at or pottery ceramic traditions. So we'll walk through these here. First off, we have Bisenyaki, which is this reddish brown pottery all the way back in the sixth century. Then we have Imariyaki, um, this Korean potters, really during the Edo period, but it was actually particularly fashionable for foreign pottery because it was made largely by farmers and had this wabi-sabi, this rusticity and simple aesthetic that the Japanese found quite appealing. Here we have Karatsuyaki. This is the common Western style of Japanese pottery, often with a scroll design, but not with a highly polished interior that shows up. Ondoyaka. Uh, yaki, the Kyushu produced by families, and this was passed on only to their children with beautiful incised design. But note the beautiful um, layering of different kind of textural elements. The most famous is teaware aesthetics called Raku uh, out of Kyoto. And these are really the Zen aesthetics that we talked about in the last class with the idea of Zen um, Buddhism features. And Seto Yaki um, by Aichi, the most produced Japanese pottery. And note the un or the, the finished nature, but note how it is not exactly symmetrical. The Japanese are one of the few cultures in the world that have a preference for asymmetry. In a Japanese home, in terms of kind of what we'll be talking about later on today with Shinto as well, the entire home is actually portable and movable from the interior. And so basically what we're going to call is what the are called is ryokan or these bedrooms with removable beds in the back. So you can move the beds, put them away, so you can actually have a, deep, a completely different confederation or configuration that shows up. So you can, in the morning, have a bedroom, and the afternoon, you can have a dinner room, a dining room, and during the day, you can have a game room. And that's because there's these fusuma, these panels, which can slide from side to side, that redefine spaces within a room, and shoji doors with this beautiful translucent paper that can be opened or used almost with window screens to block off parts of nature, but also to allow breezes within. The entire aspect is dedicated with three by six foot long tatami mats that actually place the four plat. And so rather than saying when you're moving into um, a Japanese house, they're saying, oh, it's a 10 foot room by a, a 20 foot room. They'll say it's a three and a half tatami by a four and a half tatami. And so in the Genkan, the entranceway, you take off your shoes. Now, this is very, very handy within the Japanese world because it keeps germs and other things that are on your shoes, mud, dirt, from coming in your house. It makes the house much less dirty than it otherwise would be. The Japanese also come up and are largely on the aspect of tea, and particularly with the tea ceremony that we talked about last time, thought it'd be nice to look at the history of tea here from TEDx. During a long day spent roaming the forest in search of edible grains and herbs, the weary divine farmer, Shen Nong, accidentally poisoned himself 72 times. But before the poisons could end his life, a leaf drifted into his mouth. He chewed on it, and it revived him. And that is how we discovered tea. Or so an ancient legend goes, at least. Tea doesn't actually cure poisonings, but the story of Shen Nong, the mythical Chinese inventor of agriculture, highlights tea's importance to ancient China. Archaeological evidence suggests tea was first cultivated there as early as 6,000 years ago, or 1,500 years before the pharaohs built the Great Pyramids of Giza. That original Chinese tea plant is the same type that's grown around the world today, yet it was originally consumed very differently. It was eaten as a vegetable or cooked with grain porridge. Tea only shifted from food to drink 1,500 years ago when people realized that a combination of heat and moisture could create a complex and varied taste out of the leafy greens. After hundreds of years of variations to the preparation method, 
The standard became to heat tea, pack it into portable cakes, grind it into powder, mix with hot water, and create a beverage called mo cha or matcha. Matcha became so popular that a distinct Chinese tea culture emerged. Tea was the subject of books and poetry, the favorite drink of emperors, and a medium for artists. They would draw extravagant pictures in the foam of the tea, very much like the espresso art you might see in coffee shops today. In the 9th century, during the Tang Dynasty, a Japanese monk brought the first tea plant to Japan. The Japanese eventually developed their own unique rituals around tea, leading to the creation of the Japanese tea ceremony. And in the 14th century, during the Ming Dynasty, the Chinese emperor shifted the standard from tea pressed into cakes to loose leaf tea. At that point, China still held a virtual monopoly on the world's tea trees, making tea one of three essential Chinese export goods, along with porcelain and silk. This gave China a great deal of power and economic influence as tea drinking spread around the world. That spread began in earnest around the early 1600s when Dutch traders brought tea to Europe in large quantities. Many credit Queen Catherine of Braganza, a Portuguese noblewoman, for making tea popular with the English aristocracy when she married King Charles II in 1661. At the time, Great Britain was in the midst of expanding its colonial influence and becoming the new dominant world power. And as Great Britain grew, interest in tea spread around the world. By 1700, tea in Europe sold for 10 times the price of coffee, and the plant was still only grown in China. The tea trade was so lucrative that the world's fastest sailboat, the clipper ship, was born out of intense competition between Western trading companies. All were racing to bring their tea back to Europe first to maximize their profits. At first, Britain paid for all this Chinese tea with silver. When that proved too expensive, they suggested trading tea for another substance, opium. This triggered a public health problem within China as people became addicted to the drug. Then in 1839, a Chinese official ordered his men to destroy massive British shipments of opium as a statement against Britain's influence over China. This act triggered the first opium war between the two nations. Fighting raged up and down the Chinese coast until 1842, when the defeated Qing dynasty ceded the port of Hong Kong to the British and resumed trading on unfavorable terms. The war weakened China's global standing for over a century. The British East India Company also wanted to be able to grow tea themselves and further control the market. So they commissioned botanist Robert Fortune to steal tea from China in a covert operation. He disguised himself and took a perilous journey through China's mountainous tea regions, eventually smuggling tea trees and experienced tea workers into Darjeeling, India. From there, the plant spread further still, helping drive tea's rapid growth as an everyday commodity. Today, tea is the second most consumed beverage in the world, after water. And from sugary Turkish Riza tea to salty Tibetan butter tea, there are almost as many ways of preparing the beverage as there are cultures on the globe. And so I thought, as we're in Japan and talking about the Japanese tea ceremony, and we'll be showing you some different aspects where tea and looking at tea ceramics, be interesting to see the history of tea starting in China and it really influencing all over the world, including, remember, even our own Boston Tea Party, which kind of launched the American Revolutionary War. So in a traditional Japanese home, then there are particular areas, one for sleeping and you can actually have removable. There's also this area where you can have a large stale table. So here's my little guy actually at our table in the Ryokin where we actually stay, which is kind of a hotel room with portable beds that are put away during the day. So you can have dinner table where you actually sit down on the floor and you have these lovely summer meals that you can actually. There's also generally one art niche, one art niche in, and only one art niche in a Japanese home where the family's most celebrated artworks, including teaware, as you can see here, is often stored. And so this is called a tokonama. It's part of the art niche in almost all Japanese homes. Now, all of this actually has to do with the idea of Shintoism, this belief in, in nature and the power and energy and the spirits in nature. Shinto can actually be translated as way of the kami, kami or way of the spirits. So um, Shinto, that do is very similar to Tao, 
which is the energy of the universe. And that's what we're looking at here. It is a native religion of the rural agrarian spirituality and it celebrates ancestors, the elderly, emperor, and nature. And even today, there are more than 80,000 local shrines for Shinto kami and for Shinto worship in a place that in Japan, that's the size only of California. So here's an explanation of what Shinto is. More than 100 people in Tokyo celebrated the new year in a very unusual way by taking an ice cold bath. Dressed in traditional white clothing, the men and women jogged around a shrine and chanted before lowering themselves into the freezing cold water. This purification ritual is a central tenet of Shinto, a Japanese religion that is as old as the country itself. So what exactly is Shinto? Well, it's the largest religion in Japan, practiced by an estimated 80% of the population. Back in the 6th century, indigenous Japanese people invented the word Shinto to distinguish their already existing faiths from Buddhism, which was spreading throughout the region. Over time, Shinto and Buddhism came to code this piece. Shinto is considered more a way of life rather than a specific set of beliefs or worship of a central deity. Most Japanese people identify as both Buddhist and Shinto. So how can someone follow two religions at once? Well, Shinto doesn't have many of the characteristics associated with religion. Unlike Christianity or Buddhism, it has no official founder or sacred text. Shinto does not try to explain the world in a sense of right and wrong, and thus there are no Shinto preachers or missionaries. The only goal of Shinto is to be in touch with kami, or spiritual energy, through sacred rituals. These include weddings, funerals, worship at a shrine or at a home, and huge festivals. The word Shinto means way of kami. Kami is extremely complex, but basically they are sacred spirits that exist in earthy objects like mountains and trees and in concepts like fertility. Kami also has an ancestral form as humans become Kami after they die. The sun goddess Amaterasu is the most important Kami. In Japanese mythology, the royal family is thought to be descended from Amaterasu, beginning with the first emperor, Jimu. It was thought that prayers and offerings to Kami spirits at Shinto shrines and festivals will wash away evil spirits and thus purify a person or object. This process is the lifeblood of the Shinto practice, happening on a daily, weekly, seasonal, lunar, and annual basis. In fact, taking part in ritualistic worship and purification is the entirety of their faith. This has garnered criticism, as some liken Shinto worship to a performance rather than an act of devotion based on values and beliefs. Adherents to Shinto, however, think of rituals as a religious experience, one that binds a community together even more so than shared beliefs. Although Shinto is thousands of years old, it still has an active presence in Japanese life. For instance, new buildings are purified by a Shinto priest, and many Japanese-made cars are blessed during the assembly process. Japan's national sport, sumo, is directly derived from Shinto rituals, and symbols of purity can be found on the ring and on sumo garments. Many Japanese people keep a tiny shrine altar in their home, and local shrines play a huge role in communities bringing people together for festivals hosting weddings and funerals. Whether or not they identify as religious, virtually everyone in Japan is, in some sense, a part of Shinto. We can't do episodes like this without our sponsors. And this more than And so Shinto, as we're looking at here, is this celebrates a, a various aspect of natural energy and of the spirits that live in the natural forces around. So really it's a celebration of the natural world. And there's some Shinto celebrates the idea of aesthetics. Two of them in particular that are going to be important for all of Japanese art are going to be wabi and sabi. Wabi, sometimes just referred to wabi-sabi, which is purity and humility, and sabi, stillness and rusticity. So the idea of things being purified and being rustic, being of the agrarian economy. There are five basic elements in Shinto worship that show up in the natural spirit world. Sun or fire, water, mountains, trees, and stones. And when we look at Shinto art, we're going to see is a deeply felt love for unspoiled nature. Natural elements like clay and wood and rock are going to play a huge part. It's one of the few traditions around the world in art that actually practices asymmetry. And they really do value the idea of people working with natural materials like metals and with wood and with stone and with water to make handmade objects like teapots and cups. And so as we celebrate all of these different elements, Shinto celebrates aesthetics of wabi-sabi, of stillness, of deep, deeply felt love 
um, for Untoiled Nature. Look at the bottom one, Handmade Objects. One of the things that is most famous, which actually surprises many people, is this, Kinsuku Uroi. The idea is to prepare with gold. The art of repairing pottery with gold or silver, lacquer, and understanding that the pieces are more beautiful for having been broken. This idea, because it gives this semblance of earth, right? The idea of the crackleness of the earth, of the mountain, of the volcano. So when an object often gets um, broken in Japan, they will repair it with these beautiful tendons that are also often made with very expensive metals. And that actually increases the value. One of the great Shinto uh, ceremonies is the Tree Blossom Festival. It's the most beautiful one that we actually imported to Washington, D.C., where we do the cherry blossoms. And Shinto ceremony then revolves around special occasions and specifically the agricultural cycle. It consists generally of attendance upon a god, offering prayer, music, dance, socialization, food. It's like a festival or very similar to a festival than more of a religious worship because you're going out to appreciate the deeply held beauty, power, energy that exists in nature with the changing nature of the kami, of the spirits. The most famous, of course, is right behind me, and that is just the power of Mount Fuji. Climbing Mount Fuji is something that almost all Japanese people um, aspire to do, provided that their health holds out at least once in their life, because this is a major kami, a major spirit that lives here. So one of the most amazing things that me and my family have ever done, we've done the way of the kami. So me and my family, when we went to Japan, uh, my favorite family day ever, here you see my little guys, age three and a half, almost four. My daughter was six. And this little guy is about to climb a mountain, the highest mountain in all of Japan. It took us, it normally takes people a day and a half. It took us two and a half days. And he was so tired, my little guy only got up. We had to strap him and he basically collapsed and I had to carry him all the way down. But we had straps and all of that set up. And so when you're on your way up and in the local area, there are things, because it's a volcanic mountain, uh, it hasn't erupted for a while, but it's a volcanic mountain. There are places that have soft water springs. So you can stop at this lovely place called Owakabumi, and you can get a volcanic egg that you actually dip in. And so the sulfur turns the eggs black in about two minutes. The other thing that's in this area, because it's volcanic, is that there's lava underneath and flowing underneath, which heats the water. So one of the amazing things you can do in Japan, provided you don't have tattoos that are showing, which are not allowed in any of these, is an onsen, you can go to a spa. And the Japanese have brought this to an art form, as I will show you here in a minute. The spa where you can go, so we went to this particular one, a Shinto hot water spring called an onsen. In this one, you can actually go in where they heat hot wine. So literally, this is boiling wine that you can actually go in and you come out and your entire pores smell like wine. I love this girl. She was ready to go scuba diving there. Down here, you can see us. We are actually in matcha. That's the green tea room. You can get a fish pedicure. They actually eat off the dead skin off of your feet after you're done. And my wife's favorite one where she spent many an hour wilding away, you literally can bathe in coffee and they will bring you coffee to drink. So all part of the experience of nature and living with the, the kami. So the holiest Shinto shrines we have are these five. We have Emperor Nintoko burial mound, where one of the first Japanese emperors buried. The Issei shrine, this is the one that's dedicated to the sun goddess. We have the Nachi waterfall, which I'll show you. The Fushimi Inari, dedicated to wealth. And the Itsukushima shrine, dedicated to geishas and beauty um, and purity here off the coast. So let's start off with Emperor Nintoko. This is what we call a kofun. So, and this actually refers to, and I'm gonna shrink me down some, a Dyson Kofun. So the idea of a Dyson Kofun here. And that is the biggest tomb of the world. This right here, you can see the aerial spot. It covers 458 acres. It is much larger than any of the pyramids and the Great Pyramids. So you can see the Great Pyramid actually, we put it in perspective, it's how much larger everything is. And it's a circle tomb uh, that's combined with a square for rituals and ceremonies. Generally, the only individuals that are allowed in the circular part up here are members of the royal family. This is the burial site of Emperor Nintoko. So this is one of the five greatest Shinto shrines. And you can see it from the aerial. And there are other keyhole kofun that are actually in the area as well. Now, decorating these are called haniwa. 
honey wall. Honey meaning clay, wall meaning circle. So clay circles, and they mark the burial or the boundary between the living and the dead. They are used really to prevent erosion of the ground mounds as well. So the burials in heavy snowstorms or in heavy rainfalls um, don't wipe off or rub off. So they are show the respect for the material. They're all natural materials. They're dowed, each of these kami then is endowed that they invite to have their own kami spirit in to help protect the sacred ground of the emperor's boom, uh, or, or the, the emperor's tomb. What we're looking at here then are various hani wall. Note the circular element, this one's broken off, but they can represent everything in a very simplistic way, from a warrior to a horseback rider, to a home, to a deer, we saw, talked about it, the messengers of the gods. And so if you look at it, it's radically different than the Chinese model. So if you look at this, what is the difference between Chinese and Japanese clay tomb figures? You can see the realistic aspect, the idea of someone there to support. This is more of a spiritual support versus an actual realist military individual that is there to fight. They're much smaller in terms of the realism as well. And so there's much to be different, but they basically are, each of them, is to help the emperor in the next world. The next one that we want to look at is what's called the Grand Issei Shrine. This is from the Kofun period. Again, you don't need to worry about dates and times for my particular class unless I mention it. This is one of the five greatest Shinto shrines, and only the imperial family is allowed into the interior of the shrine. I love this aerial photo because it shows these images, they're rebuilt about every 20 years. And so while one is um, being rebuilt, which takes about two years. The other one is still open to the public. Then they close this one off and they open this one to the public and they allow it to rot into the ground over the next 20 years without any upkeep. So it returns back to nature. Again, remember the way of the kami, the way of the spirits. The sacred shrine is rebuilt every 20 years. And the only thing that's allowed to remain after it falls down is the ridge pole, which is this giant ridge pole for the next great Issei shrine. So certain trees, especially a tree called the cryptomeria, were considered sacred, and they grow wild in this area. So when felled, sacred quality was believed to live in the building, and many of these trees, if they got large enough, would have their own kami, their own spirit that would move in. So the sacred tree itself was symbolically present in the form of a pillar around which the shrine was constructed. So this is the base of the construction. So it's almost like you have your protective spirits you're bringing in. And so here is... The bringing of one of those giant trees that showed Painting up a 1,300-year-old tradition is hard work. So this is at Issei. Here in the Isuzu River in central Japan is the local version of Backyard Blitz. So this renovation takes considerably longer. 20 years longer. And it will look exactly how it looked before. It's the rebuilding of Japan's holiest Shinto shrine. Issei Shrine has been at the center of Japan's Shinto faith for more than 1,300 years. The spirit of the sun goddess, Amaterasu Omikami, is said to reside here. She's believed to have given rise to Japan's imperial family. The next in line to the throne, Crown Prince Naruhito, is here today. He pays a visit to the sacred inner shrine. Afterwards, he pays tribute to those helping to rebuild it. The rebuilding takes eight years. First, sacred trees are selected from the forest. and then brought hundreds of kilometers to the Isuzu River. For the last part of the journey from the forests, the old and the young drag the logs the final few kilometers up the river. And with only a few days left before all the logs, thousands of them are needed in place, this year, they're letting a few outsiders help. Well, the kids are on their way. I guess it's now our turn to start dragging along behind. Oh, 
it's not that hard at first, especially when you've got a thousand other people on hand. But as things get tougher and the water gets deeper, the load starts to take its toll. It's best if you don't think about how much this all costs. As much as $500 million. About how many trees are involved? Up to 10,000 of them. Nor that they'll only be used for 20 years in the shrine. These are just not issues for most of these log haulers. As the afternoon wears on, the sun is starting to take its toll. The origin of the 20 year cycle is not entirely clear, but it's thought that two decades was the right amount of time to pass on the techniques of forestry and carpentry from father to son. And so all this to dedicate because of the sun god, um, in this case a female sun god, Amaterasu, and she was emerging from a cave and bringing light to the universe. So she's the sun goddess whose eight children form the eight main islands of Japan and whose one offspring ultimately ends up being the founder of the Chinese um, imperial line. So she was known particularly for her mirror. And in the great creation myth of Japan, the sun goddess Amaterasu once retreated into a cave because her brother had offended her and all the other gods were distraught because the sun had gone away but she was finally enticed from her rocky refuge by her royal family, hanging a mirror on a sacred tree and displaying jewels and a dance. And it's that reflection of the sun, and that's why she's the sun goddess, that pulled her out of the cave to protect and actually be the imperial line founder for Japan. Here's what that Amaterasu mirror looks like. Here we see it here, and the reflection that shows up. So she is the greatest of all the kami, and the mirror itself became her home. So the sun mirror was set up with that within a hollowed out tree. And that's how they actually used to show um, deaths. Individuals used to be buried in hollowed out trees in Japan in the coffins. And so it's the symbolism of death through the tree trunk coffins and Amaratsu being able to go home to the heavens must be linked. This idea of death and life, of death and the sun re-emerging in an agricultural calendar, that's what is doing. And we can compare these. I mean, think about the great cosmic mirror, the TLV mirror, of the Han Dynasty, which is actually the idea of the unifier of all the heavens, versus we very have a much less symbolic, or much less symbols, but no less symbolic sun mirror from the Issei Shrine, both of, of this polished metal. Another one of the great individual shrines from um, Shintoism is this. It's Itsukushima Shrine in Miji, Miyajima Island um, in Japan from about the 12th century. And in Itsukushima Shrine, you walk through this Tori Gate. Now, as the um, high tide and low tides, low tide comes in, you can actually walk there and walk through the gate to this muddy swampland through and be slightly purified. Otherwise, you have to approach it. Otherwise, you have to up approach it through um, a boat that shows up, and you go through the Tori Gate to purify yourself. The shrine's construction itself separates the holy island from the secular waters. It is an island that's off the coast of Japan. And commoners, dogs, pregnant women, people that are near death, sick, they're not allowed on the island. It's a completely pure island. And so if you have to go off the island for a funeral, you have to go through a ritual purity site to ever come back on the island. So you enter through the floating purifying Tori gate, like we saw, and then you wash, you use um, incense um, that's burning to make sure that you're clean and purified. And the main shrine here is dedicated to three goddess daughters. Goddess, goddess daughters of the powerful storm god Susano. 
and because they're daughters, it's going to refer to a fair amount of female art forms that developed. So as we look at this, this is also where traditional Chinese or Chinese, traditional Japanese theater was invented. The No and the Kyogan theater were both invented in this area. Kabuki is a little bit more sexualized than somewhere else. Origami and Ikebana, Origami the paper folding, and Ikebana the, plow, the flower arrangement that's so famous from Japan with their wabi-sabi, Shinto, and a mix a little bit of Zen aesthetics for the idea of the simplicity and the hard work, those were also invented at this particular shrine. And so the no stage here that comes here, and there is a floating no stage that's the most famous no stage in all of Japan. It's a classical theater of Japan. It's also the oldest professional theater that we have in the world. It was believed that Kanami and his son Ziyami brought no to its present day form here at Itsukashima. And the no play generally takes 30 to 120 minutes and it involves all categories, mostly of male actors. So it really is on the aesthetic of Yugen, the idea of depth, darkness, beauty, elegance, sadness at the loss of ephemeral. That's very much a Tao or very much a Buddhist and a Shinto concept, right? With the changing of the seasons, with things that regenerate with one another, to not get too attached to desires. So no is believed to it has to pierce the everyday reality and reach for hidden truth. That's a very Zen aesthetic. If you note the dates, that's right when Zen is being promoted. So both Zen and No then see outward reality as illusory. And the point of theater was to work beyond the words and beyond the senses. And so here's an explanation of that, knowing full well that this is, if you'd like to see that um, play, by all means, go back and you can watch the end of the video. But I wanted to show you some things that actually show up with No as it's being developed at Itsukushima Theory Theater basically for Amaterasu. And so one of the comments that shows up is this, if an actor thinks he has attained a higher level of skill than he has reached, he will even lose the level he has achieved. So the most important uh, action for the shite, besides that mask, is a gesture that they're going to lock into that you will actually pick up on. And so we will skip over a little bit because they did a good job. The other thing that actually shows up within this process is the idea of Ikebana, which is a, is a Shinto flower arrangement. So remember, Shinto celebrates the aesthetics of wabi, pur purity and humility, and sabi, the idea of stillness and rusticity. And this kind of stillness comes through here, and rusticity from these um, natural elements that are done in highly civilized spots. So this shows a deeply felt love for unspoiled nature, natural elements, as you can see, even in terms of the clay pots, asymmetry, you can see, very much played here, and handmade objects, such as teapots, cups, and it actually is a training process to become an Ikebana um, director, which often many times both samurai and geishas would learn how to do. The other style of theater that develops then is much more masculine and sexualized and really for not the aristocracy as much as others, and the one that's most famous is Kabuki. And this is Kabuki theater drama with makeup. Makeup there is called Keisho in Japan. So they have exaggerated facial lines to produce dramatic animal supernatural masks for the actors. They have a me, which is a picturesque pose to establish the character as you see here. And the players insert puns on actors' names, ad libs, contemporary references, um, sexual innuendos abound. So here's the idea of Kabuki. Hey there, I'm Mike Regnetta. This is Crash Course Theater, and today we're going to be raising the curtain on a form of Japanese theater that actually used a curtain. It's Kabuki. We're also going to look at Bunraku, an uncannily lifelike form of puppet theater that gained popularity at about the same time as Kabuki. Get your hooded narrators and your 12 best kimonos ready. It's lights up. Kabuki developed during the Tokugawa Shogunate, a military government that ruled from 1603 to 1868. After a series of disastrous civil wars, the government finally achieved peace and prosperity while practicing a strict isolationism that allowed native arts to flourish. But all that repression needed an outlet. No just wasn't enough anymore, especially now that the new middle class wanted to go to the theater too. So how did Kabuki begin? Oh hey, it's Lude Mime. Welcome back, Ludmine. I haven't seen you since the advent of liturgical drama. Around 1603, a female dancer from the Izumo Grand Shrine named Okuni began to perform publicly on a makeshift stage in a dry riverbed in Kyoto. 
Her programs got really popular, and eventually Okuni began mixing dance with little playlists and occasional cross-dressing to create lengthier shows. Corazon began adopting her style and making increasingly elaborate performances set to the music of the shamisen, a three-stringed, lute-like instrument. These performances included dances, jokes, and a lot of sexy costumes with scenes set in bathhouses because, I mean, you know, Corazon. This style was eventually called the Ana Kabuki, or Women's Kabuki. An alternate name was Prostitute Singing and Dancing. Even though this was supposedly a theater for the emergent middle class and samurai were supposed to be above this kind of thing, samurai weren't. Concerned about the corrupting influence, authorities outlawed women performers in 1629. But kabuki, which means to tilt, continued, now restricted to the red light district of Edo, where it could be regulated. This red light district was called ukiya, or the floating world, and it was pretty much the naughty pre-1990s Times Square of its day, except you know, more tea houses. Since women could no longer perform, the roles were played by young boys, who also prostituted themselves to samurai. The shogun hated this and kept trying to regulate it, so in 1642, men playing women's roles were outlawed, and in 1648, homosexuality was outlawed, and in 1652, all young male actors were outlawed. It's almost like theater isn't the problem. Anyway, it was at this point that a men's kabuki formed. All the actors were grown dudes, and just to make sure that they wouldn't attract samurai, laws required them to shave their foreheads and abstain from making themselves attractive. The sexy scenes were also vetoed. Sorry, Levi. A typical kabuki program lasted 12 hours until 1868 when the government passed more laws and required that there be an eight-hour maximum. A performance usually began with a historical drama called a Jidai Mono, which featured battles and samurai. This was followed by a dance, which was in turn followed by a ripped from the headlines domestic drama or sui mono, and for dessert, a comic dance. The performances were highly physical, with lots of stage combat and martial arts. Occasionally, actors would stop and hold a pose called a mi, which signaled a heightened moment in the narrative. While only women's roles were danced at first, eventually dance became so important to the form that in the 1700s, choreographers were added to kabuki companies. Now, perhaps you're curious how exactly kabuki differs from no, then. Well, kabuki plays are full of plot and spectacle, sword fights, mystical creatures, and special effects. They're less concerned with enlightenment and more about just having a good time. The theater professor Peter Arnett wrote, no is austere, kabuki flamboyant. No ritual kabuki spectacle. No offers spiritual consolation kabuki physical excitement. No seeks chaste models. Kabuki delights in the eccentric, the extravagant, and the willfully perverse. No is gentle kabuki cruel. No is concerned with the hereafter kabuki bound by the here and now. Kabuki may have been fun, wild, cruel, and contemporary, but actors took it very seriously. Most kabuki actors were born into the profession, training from age six or seven, and not considered mature artists until 40. While the plays are extravagant, the acting is often very restrained. As Chikamatsu Manzaemon, the greatest and most famous kabuki playwright, once wrote, since it is moving when all parts of the art are controlled by restraint, the stronger and firmer the melody and words are, the sadder will be the impression created. Actors were that was the Shakespeare and Kabuki theater. Perhaps unsurprised to learn. For the most part, they could only marry into other actor families and were ordered to live near the theaters. But acting families were famous for their unique kata, or style, and Kabuki actors were the rock stars of their day, attracting obsessive fans who lived for gossip about their lives and rivalries, and who would offer them presents on opening night. Male actors who played female roles, called onagata actors, were especially popular. A lot of them lived as women, even off stage, which is very method. If an onagata threw a used towel into the crowd, it could cause a riot. In Kabuki, there are a few basic types of roles. The onagata, takiyaku, brave hero types, katakiyaku, mean villain types, and koyaku, children's roles. Unlike no actors, kabuki actors don't wear masks, but each character type has specific makeup associated with it. Actors start by painting their faces with a white base, and then they add red and black, with blue and brown if you happen to be playing a demon. Onagata actors draw on fake eyebrows, and if they're playing married women, they blacken their teeth. The costumes are 
elaborate and can weigh as much as 50 pounds. Onagata playing court ladies wore 12 kimonos, one after the other. But because actors were outcasts and the shogunate had a lot of laws, actors could actually be jailed if their costumes were too nice. The kabuki stage was somewhat different from the no stage. It was wider, extending the full width of the auditorium, and at some point, a curtain was added. It was also built for exciting special effects and quick scene changes. It used elevator traps, and the stage revolved on a turntable. The biggest difference was the hanamichi, or flower way, a runway that ran from the back of the theater right up to the stage and allowed the actors to walk through the audience. This was the 18th century equivalent of 3D, and fans loved it so much that some theaters added a second hanamichi. Kabuki was a literary form, though the script was usually secondary to the acting, and actors were encouraged to improvise. Unlike no, most early kabuki plays were set in the present, and a lot of them took place in the ukiya, the floating world of smut, the same place that you would go to see these plays. A narrator was present on stage, Sometimes the actors would speak their own dialogue, but often the narrator would do it. We're going to look at one of these plays, but first we're going to look at Bunraku, the puppet theater, which developed around the same time as Kabuki. The two forms often influenced each other. Initially, these puppets were just heads. No, well, yeah, but like with eyes and hair and skin and stuff. Eventually, the heads grew hands and feet, and then someone was like, let's go nuts and give them bodies. The more sophisticated puppets also have moving eyes and eyebrows, and in action, Bunraku is some uncanny valley stuff. Oh, God, stop staring at me. Puppet theater stages were big, 36 feet by 23 feet, and also pretty innovative. Like kabuki theaters, they had elevator traps to move props and scenery on and off the stage. As in kabuki, an announcer, hooded in black, told the story. Three puppeteers manipulated each puppet. By the 1730s, the puppets were about four feet tall. One puppeteer controlled the head and the right arm, one the left arm, and one the feet. If you were a puppeteer, you had to spend 10 years doing the feet and then 10 on the hand before they'd even let you touch the head. In case you hadn't picked up on the trend, Japanese theater doesn't mess around. The most famous of the Bunraku playwrights was Chikamatsu Manzaemon, who you may remember, was also the most popular kabuki playwright. That is the Shakespeare He's often of the day. called the Japanese Shakespeare. But did Shakespeare master the puppet arts? He did not. Take that, William. Chikamatsu likes to pull sensational plots from the newspapers and then dramatize them, especially love suicide plays. Basically, these do what they say on the tin. The whole genre of plays about forbidden love that end in death. Just like Romeo and Juliet. eventually banned as too sensational and too likely to inspire copycat suicide. The following 1703 play is a domestic tragedy based on an actual event, the double suicide of Tokube, a dealer in soy sauce, and Ohatsu, a courtesan. Now, maybe you're thinking that the death of a soy sauce salesman doesn't sound that tragic, but let's remember that the audience was full of soy guys, and this really happened. Help us out, Thought Bubble. Tokube loves Ohatsu, but he's being pressured to marry the boss's daughter, and his mom has accepted the dowry. It's a miracle I'm still alive. If they make my story into a three-act play, I'm sure the audience will weep, he says. Nice, Tokube. So, Tokube manages to get the dowry money back, but because he's not the smartest, he lends it to his friend Kuheiji. And when he's like, Kuheiji, I need that money back, Kuheiji's all, what money? You forged that IOU, and also I think you stole my wallet. Tokube's like, well now I have to marry the boss's daughter for real, but also I'm dishonored, and I'll never be able to see Ohatsu again. Guess my only choice is to kill myself. And Ohatsu is like, same. Oh, and by the way, this is a conversation they have just with their feet while Tokube is hiding under Ohatsu's skirt. Tokube spends the night under the porch of Ohatsu's brothel. Just before morning, the couple put on death clothes, go to the Sonazaki shrine where they listen to late night revelers in the tea house across the river, and sing a song about love suicide. Again, subtle. They have a kind of marriage ceremony and tie themselves to a tree. Tokube slits Ohatsu's throat and then his own. The narrator tells us that their story whispers through the Sonazaki wood, and today, high and low alike, gather to pray for these two lovers who, beyond a doubt, will in the future attain Buddhahood. They have become models 
of true love. Thank you, Thought Bubble. Have they, though? Buddhahood aside, you can see how different this feels from now. It's swift, it's contemporary, it's full of plot. It's far more emotional than philosophical, and there's a lot to cry about. The excitement of these plays may explain why Kabuki is still being performed today. But Raku, too, there's hope for you yet. Next time, we're going to investigate another form of Eastern dance drama, the Southeast Asian party all night kill the demon at dawn form called Katkali. So when we look at the history of Kabuki here, as they go through, it really is the idea of a prostitute theater that begins with very ribald, very much for individuals that are of the middle class that really don't want to be educated and overwhelmed by the Zen-like nature that shows up in No. Remember, the vast majority of the middle class are more likely to be in the, the level of Pure Land Buddhism already. So the other art form that develops at the Itsu Itsukishima Shrine is origami. And that's the idea to fold a paper square of, into different shapes. So the origami models were incorporated into Shinto religious ceremonies, and geishas would actually have to um, master this art form, as well as did samurais. The wood, or the word for paper, is kami. It's a homonym for the word for spirit or god. So the two are very closely related. The fourth version then that we have after all the theater things at the Itsukishima Shrine is going to Fushi Inari Shrine or the Fushimi Inari Shrine and that's the god of rice and business and so the symbols here as you can see are fox deer tori or keys to rice granary if you've seen um the the image of um where was this at uh, memoirs of a geisha main memoirs of a geisha you've actually seen the geishas will often walk through here because it was dedicated to business and geisha is a business so you can see you walk through the thousand and one or the 32,000 gates um, and shrines that go up a mountain and then down a mountain it's about a two mile walk and the last one is the nachi waterfall generally considered one of the five greatest shinto shrines the first japanese painting where the landscape is the focus is based upon the nachi waterfall so as whereas buddhist subjects seen against the landscape um, in the Shinto painting, the landscape is the subject because the landscape was the residence of the great kami, Hiryo Gongi. And so here we actually have, because it's the landscape of the kami spirit as well, that becomes the focus, which is radically different than Travelers Amongst Mountains and Streams, which gives you a chance to compare and contrast. Now, the last thing we want to look at um, before we look at any garden architecture is this. This is Gagaku. It's the oldest ensemble music in the world, and it's elegant or refined. This is Japanese court music that shows up for 1,000 years. And so if we listen to a piece, or we will listen to a piece in a moment, they have a different series um, that we have. So they're going to have a number of different, so this is an orchestra piece. And so they're going to have some string instruments. Note the biwa is very similar to the pipa from China. The hichiriku, it's a double reed pipe, so it's different than what we saw in China with the DC, but the Hichiriki is a double reed pipe and it's a transverse, so you actually blow into it or an end blown flute. So you blow in at the end rather than a transverse flute, which is what the, the DZ was from China. You also note you'll have more percussion instruments, many of which we actually have not seen at all yet. The difference is the melody. The melody is often carried over by the show, which is a mouth organ that you'll see here as well. So this is based upon smoothness, serenity, and precise execution, which is different than China, remember, where there was no tonality till the 20th, or no pure tonality till the 20th century. So it's various with a lot of vibrato um, and a lot of kind of overlapping sound quality. The major melody is generally played by the Hichiriki, that's short, double reeded uh, bamboo, basically like an oboe, and the flute, the show, the mouth organ, and finally the percussion. The rhythm, slow pieces have eight beat rhythm moderate have a four beat rhythm and fast pieces have a two beat rhythm so they're already standardized and the tempo generally gets very fast near the end and then the pace decreases as the instruments drop out so here's a piece of gagaku music remember court music of japan that's the hichiriki And note how formulaic it is. Mm -hmm. 
So there's the flute from um, Japan that's similar to the uh, transverse flute that we actually have called the DC. The person in the background, you can notice lifting up, that's the mouth organ, the show. And I'm gonna move this along so you can see how the beat picks up later on. There's often a very elegant court dance that goes along with it. Perfectly synchronized. And to show you what you can do, I wanna show you one other piece, one of my favorite pieces of Gagaku music, which you will actually find entertaining. Three string instrument, very similar to the air hu that we saw from China. There's the Chinese version, or well, the Japanese version of the Chinese DT. Note how different the singing tonality is. from the singing. And so here's the, the equivalent of what we're looking at. The Chinese Gu Sheng is basically um, the chin, the shakuhachi, which is the end blown flute that we heard, um, which we can actually hear here. And the kodo um, is the Japanese version of the Chinese zither. All right, let me skip over to this right here. All right, we talked about samurai culture. All right, the last thing that I want to talk about is Japanese gardens. And there's between Japanese gardens and Chinese gardens. So the typical features of a Japanese garden, unlike a scholar garden that shows up, it's the idea that you have a centralized viewing pavilion. We saw that actually in the Japanese model two. Rocks or stone arrangements, again, a Japanese version. A lantern, typically of stone, that really is a Japanese um, feature that shows up. Tea house or pavilion, largely a Japanese. An asymmetrical, asymmetrical design. We see that in both, but really does dominate and as a, a Japanese aesthetic, the Chinese adopt. Water for real or symbolic, not fountains, like we saw in many parts of China. And the water might actually be pebbles that are made to look like the flow of water. An enclosure device, such as a hedge or fence or a wall for traditional character, a bridge or an island on stepping stones, and also having to zigzag back and forth. And most of these features are actually in a Chinese scholar garden too. And so the gardens are supposed to show all the aspects of the Zen life, which we talk about as humility, labor, service, a life of prayer and gratitude, and a life of meditation. And they're a combination at the same time with Shinto, Shinto with Wabi, purity, humility, stillness, rusticity, and the idea that the five elements are supposed to show through. Sun or fire, mountains, trees, water, stones, and the Shinto art beliefs are also here as well. Deeply felt love for unspoiled nature, natural materials, clay and wood, asymmetry, handmade objects. So it really is a professional way because you're combining two different religions and all sorts of different features in order to make these beautiful elements. So there are different types of gardens. There are blue-green landscapes coming out of the history of the Great Period in Japanese history, referring back to the Great Period of Chinese history of the Tang with the blue-green landscapes. We have 
um, gardens that are specifically designed for night views and for lighting up. We have moss gardens, specifically rather than using grass that use moss. We have dry and rock gardens that show up for Zen meditation. We have strolling gardens where you walk through the garden and fully appreciate it. We have hide and reveal gardens where you have uneven paths placed in specific places to prompt people to look down because otherwise they'll step in the water. And so when they look down, oh, there's something there of a flower or there's a reflection from the plant overhead that they did not see and they have to turn around. So when the observer looks up, they see an eye-catching sight which enlivens the spirit and enlivens and enlightens the spirit. So when we look at this, and here's the book that's the standard today. Come on. The book that is the standard today. Here we go. The opening of Zuan's Japanese gardens illustration from 1466. If you have not studied gardens, you must not make gardens. In closing, you must never show this writing to outsiders, but keep it secret. China and Japan very much want to keep their cultural heritage secret. Remember, in China, they made, if anyone told the secrets of the silk industry, the emperor could have them put to death. The same would be true with rock gardens or of garden techniques in the Japanese tradition. And there are gardens everywhere. There are restrictions actually on who can go, when you can go. So right in the middle of Tokyo, they have one of the most beautiful gardens, a version of Central Park, you might say, and that is the Hamariku Gardens. Note Riku, because they have a wonderful tea house that's in the style of Riku, who actually developed the, the tea ceremony. And so when you explore a Japanese garden, you walk around and look at the different types of gardens and evaluate what are the Shinto aesthetics. And note, there are thousands of people at this garden. Where are they? They are tucked on. So then when you're walking around, it feels like you very much have a view of the garden to yourself. Here's the moon viewing pavilion where people would go and drink and have a lovely moonlight and evening party with the emperor or they would actually use that lake to go out and see that and my daughter reflecting upon in this case you don't see it but there are fish ducks and turtles right underneath her note that you actually have to hop and pay attention to where you're walking because there are times where you can actually fall in the water and so this is the idea of the hide and reveal image of the gardens these were also there this is the moss garden i showed you before and so you could potentially create a Japanese rock garden using just these elements. Now remember, it's got to include Zen. It's got to include the features of Shinto. So it's got to include all those different aspects. Plus it's got to include an important Zen number. Three, four, um, eight, seven, 12, 15. It's got to have those numbers included within it. And so Zen gardens stage views of space and depth where there was neither. That's the goal. The garden consists of raked gravel, and in this case, 15, note the significant number for Buddhism, moss-covered uh, boulders. The, also, the awesome thing about this is that this, the rocks are placed so that when you are looking at the garden from any angle, other than from above, which you can't see into a modern-day technology, you only ever see 14 of the 15 boulders at one time. There's always one hidden. The idea of Zen, idea of hard work and finding it. So the interpretations of the placement of the rocks vary. Could be gravel, ocean, and rocks, the islands of Japan. Could be the rocks are symbol of a mother and tiger with cubs swimming to a dragon. Could be that the rocks form part of the kanji for heart or mind. The rocks form the subliminal image of a tree. And the spacing is self-sufficient, self-reliance, like the islands. And it might be more in these. So this is the most famous Japanese rock garden called Ryoenji in Kyoto, which is the Temple of the Peaceful Dragon. And it's just a spectacular achievement because it combines Shinto Zen, Wabi Sabi, the numerical that we actually need. So it took three years to design this garden, the simplicity of that garden itself. So you can compare and contrast Japanese and Chinese gardens to see very much the difference between a scholar's garden, the enclosed, and the open garden, also with the zigzag that sets the frames for different aspects. And along as we're on that, they also have the idea of bonsai tree. Bonsai tree are tree cultivation styles. And so this is also part of the Wabi Sabi Shinto Zen Buddhist asymmetry self-reliance. There's all sorts of these. And in Japan, there are annual competitions and some of these sell for thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we have different types. We have the upright formal tree, another upright formal tree, or upright informal tree. You'd see the asymmetry. We have the forest of individual trees. 
the cascade where it hangs over, a stem over the rock. You see the rock, how it actually grows around. We have the slant tree. Here are the trees actually meant to prune the bonsai tree. Bonsai aesthetics are the same. Wabi-sabi, miniatur miniatur miniaturization, any of proportion, asymmetry, no trace of the artist, so it's natural, and gravitas, that it's actually serious versus a, a playful. And the two greatest bonsai trees in the history of the world right now are these two, both in China, or both in Japan. One is Kunio, that is an 800 year old tree that folds in almost like someone's dancing on top of themselves. And Goshin, which is the forest style and the protector of the spirit tree, which are both considered beautiful and wonderful accomplishments in bonsai. And that's what we're looking at. All of this natural elements then shows up even more looking at natural elements, such as the great wave off of Kokusai. So what I want you to do is actually find the Japanese Zen and Shinto aesthetics that happen to be here. It's a pretty amazing thing. Also in class, we're gonna go over this. What do Yoda, Buddha, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Confucius have in common? Explore Buddhism, Taoism, Legalism, and Confucius in the Star Wars. Here's what you're gonna be doing. Star Wars as Asian philosophy. As we look through, I would like to go, I would like you to go through, and I would like to label and see, do these actually conform to different aspects oh, excuse me, of Asian philosophy or religion? Is there anything that is Hindu about these? And if so, what specifically and who does it refer to? Is there anything Shinto within these things? If so, what do they were to refer to? Is there anything Taoist or Confucian? Is there anything within the idea of any form of Buddhism? And what type of Buddhism? Is it esoteric? Is it Zen? Is it pure land? What are we looking at? And so if you look, may the force be with you. Well, the force is kind of the flow of chi. So we can clearly make that, end, that reference to Taoism. Does that also refer to something else? So that's one of the activities we'll be doing in class as well. So thank you very much and have a lovely night. Good night.